Hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming to Language of Textiles. Now you might be wondering what is this about? Um, first, let's introduce ourselves again in case you weren't here yesterday. <laughs> I'm Valores Requiem. And I'm Toasty. <laughs> yes. And so um, Language of Textiles, I get a lot of uh, questions when I make my costumes on like, how do you pick your materials? How do you pick your fabrics? And I'm gonna go into a in depth with the creative process of this. So you get a little understanding on, you know, how textiles and stuff can like speak for you essentially. So here's a little brief overview. I'm gonna talk about like basically, obviously, why do we need clothing? Obviously we can't run around naked, but <laughs> We'll explain that. And then uh, we're going to go into like representations of like color, environment, um, things that affect how clothing looks when you just look at someone and say, hmm, this person does sports. I think so with the, the logo here. I mean, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. This, this spandex does, you know, it says something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> There's also um, cultural things that are tied into um, clothing that is obviously uh, seen. Like uh, we'll get into in depth with that later, um, and then we'll talk about how translating 2D um, characters into 3D um, using those textiles, and then there will be a Q and A after for um, any questions about like textiles themselves. Okay, so the importance of clothing. Why Obvi do we need clothes? Why do we need why, clothes? Why do we wear clothes? I mean, I can't run around naked. I mean, we don't need pants, right? We pants? have to wear pants all the I time. Mean, I, I... <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, why do we wear clothes? The first thing that usually comes into mind, if it's freezing cold outside, I'm going to freeze myself off. So you want protection um, from weather, the elements, you know, even if it's hot outside, you're not going to go outside wearing a fur coat. Um, I'm not going to run around in Antarctica wearing a bikini. Yeah. Sounds fun, but also kind of not fun. So no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. A lot of clothing has uh, a tie with like the environment you're in. Um, this is also expressed in a lot of characters from a bunch of different series. Um, some examples we have here, we have like Magi, um, it's mostly in a setting of like a desert area, warm climates. We usually see like light colors, light textiles, which is like fabrics, cottons are popular, things that breathe. I'm not going to wear my suit in the desert. Um, an example here for Ed, usually we see Ed from uh, Full Metal. Uh, wearing his classic red coat, but this is a different variation. Obviously, he's in a pretty cold place right now, and of course, they gave him fur to kind of show that. It's kind of like uh, an unspoken language, like I said. It's it's a language of textiles. Just stuff that like is kind of common sense to us that we don't really think about, but whenever you're like, oh yeah, well, I guess that, that makes sense. Like, I mean, obviously, I wouldn't do that, but like, why? Like, and it just comes down to, like, we have the physical need as as organisms to protect ourselves from the elements. You oh, know? yeah. Every day we're just like, what am I going to wear today? What's it like outside? I'm wearing this. So, I mean, even card capture Sakura here, she's um, wearing a raincoat because she was fighting a rain element, a water element. So a lot of things, again, tie together. Another reason we see is, again, protection-based, but it's also armor-based or, again, sports-based. Um, like here with uh, Yaoi Peta, we see, like, the different colored helmets for different, color, uh, for different characters. So it kind of just kind of helps express their personality without even just telling you, hey, this is what this person's about. Um, even Griffith here... Obviously, he's more of an antagonist. He's a villain, and uh, he's wearing armor. He's wearing white. Uh, we'll get into colors later because colors can also affect the meaning of things, too. So colors, here we are. 
Um, they do have a relationship with the environment. Again, you're, we always hear about like wearing black in the summer. Goths, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> love yourself. <laughs> <laughs> wearing black in the summer. There is a few gray areas, you know, rebels that, that wear black in the summer, but there's nothing wrong with that. But as far as like characters, most characters have a certain uh, connection with uh, colors and their um, uh, attire, which is uh, the most popular uh, rep representation I can think of is uh, Avatar. Yeah. Avatar. Literally speaking for the elements, like we think of hot and we're like, wow. Red. Red. Fire. Fire. Hot. <laughs> light. Yellow. The sun. Water. Water. Blue. blue. Because that's what we per or ice. perceive. Yeah, or ice. Because yeah. we perceive water as blue. And then earth is obviously green, green. because of trees. So. You know, just little things here and there that like, we don't details. really think about, but like trying to like bring it into like the left side of your brain here to like try to keep that in the back of your mind as we get a little farther into this. Because right now, like you may be thinking like, okay, well, yeah, like, like we know that we know green is trees and, and whatnot, but just, just kind of just hold it right there for hold a second. Right it'll come and back. then it'll come back full circle and you'll be like, oh, 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 oh okay. So obviously colors and temperature elements, light, dark, heat, cold, and then colors and emotions. Emotions, yeah. Usually the broody types and more reserved types where blacks, blues, purples, darker color schemes, the more bright and positive outgoing characters are usually red, yellow, orange, warm color schemes because it just helps reflect that personality out. Um, bright colors, neon even includes that too. Um, like softer things or mm -hmm. pastels also. Pastels also fall into a softer, happier like um, category. And then obviously our last one is colors and ideologies. Like we all have different personal perceptions of how we feel about colors and how we think about colors and how they represent us besides things like my favorite color is purple. So for me, Purple would be like how I try to personify like my own likes and personality and whatnot. But purple may be something else for somebody else, right? So we use colors to help us stand out in a crowd. Like obviously, like she mentioned wearing goth clothes in the summer. Like obviously, you know, like you want to stand out. You want to represent yourself. And and we express that in our clothing without even really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And then there's also symbolism too. So going back to the color of black. Black is often associated with things like death and broodiness, like she mentioned. White can be, you know, light and purity, and red in some cultures can be like marriage or even like anger if we're drawing it back mm -hmm. to, you know, emotions and whatnot. And I mean, logos can even fall into symbolism too. If you wear a certain logo, you like the brand, you want to share the brand, you want to share to people, hey, I like this. So it's kind of like communicating without words. Mm -hmm. So culture and textiles, um, this is about like tying in culture aspects into clothing themselves. Uh, through textiles, you see um, things like religious based characters. Um, let's say there's like a Pope character or something. Usually there's like some kind of symbolism or shape. The hat, the crosses is an example that is obvious for the religious tie into it. There's hobbies, sports. Uh, social circles, education, like um, a lot of the school-based mm -hmm. um, series with uniforms and the little patch that everyone sees, that's to define their, their school that they're associated with. And so it's just, again, we come back to the unspoken rule of unspoken language. Right. And going back to the whole color theory here, um, I know that I've probably talked about this a lot this weekend because it's like hot on my mind, but we have color representation of of our hobbies like sports and even that sports also kind of goes hand in hand with schools because schools have their school colors, mm -hmm. teams have their own school colors and things like Homecoming. that. Homecoming. Homecoming, you know, um, Harry Potter, like people have associations with their hobbies through whatever house it is that they represent and so on and so forth. And it can even go into... Um, like social status, like she mentioned, like you have different colors sometimes within schools and uh, school hierarchies for like um, like varsity or, or JV or so on and so forth. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even like with the image here, we see Katara with her necklace, which is really important to her. It's a symbol of her culture. It's a symbol of who she is, her family. It's very important. And so these little details are good to pay attention when you're picking out materials and things for, for a costume because you want to make sure you kind of portray the character even with the, they have something important to them. You don't want to miss a little detail like that because, again, it's important to the character. And social status is a big one, a big, big one that basically shows, like, between characters, their relationship of their status, essentially. Mm -hmm. You got the high class and the lower class. Now, a lot of series have this in it. You might not pay attention to it, you know, too often, right? But all of a sudden, you'll you'll see the click with like high class um, status. You see, that's the blingy stuff, the fancy stuff. We got textiles that are rich. Um, what else? Well, yeah, like like she said, we have things that we associate with um, being high class, like things like furs or like really rich fabrics, like velvet, silk. Um, satin can sometimes even be mm -hmm. perceived as like a high class thing, and and then a lot of times whenever we're we're ingesting media and whatnot, a lot of times, especially in a, a fantasy setting, um, people will be like, oh yeah, there's so and so, um, the high lord, the, the of high lord of who knows what, you know, <laughs> and so we see a picture of them and we um automatically like put two and two together, like oh well, this guy looks important, mm -hmm. this person looks important because of these things that we associate to be like with expensive items like fur as mentioned before and then color association too because there's that whole drawback thing from like what came with like you know the Byzantine Empire and whatnot with you know the color indigo and purple becoming like a color of royalty mm -hmm. just because that was what was so sought after after that time and it has such a long-lasting impression on history and us even today that we even think about it now and associate it as such. And a lot of characters are drawn upon historical elements. Like whenever um, producers and directors are doing their research time when making a series and stuff, they go look into these meanings, these actual meanings behind fabric and culture and colors to plan out and flesh out a character's design. Um, and then, we, again, we have the lower class, which, again, those are more like... Like muted colors. Muted like things, colors. Things that we um, associate with, you know, not being afraid to, like, get down and dirty into things and, you know, whatnot. It's more functional than fashionable. Right. Yeah. Uh, you're going to pick, like, um, easier textiles, like, lighter things, um, not layered Earth tones, yes. See? Earth tones. Yeah. yeah, we got more earthy tones. A lot of um, like protags. Yeah, a lot protags of protags are usually down to earth. Yeah, a lot of our underdogs are all really down to earth, starting off from places that you know work really hard, and then they end up working, working their, their way, way up. up. And it's kind of like that class system where you know if you're starting off in like an MMO or something, and you, you're wearing like like rags or yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, you're level grinding. And so the, the really day. interesting thing about all of this is that. You know, in in everyday life, like a lot of like the middle to lower class um, areas, like to imitate what is high class, high class because they want to be associated with that too. So a lot of times, whenever you're like ingesting media, you'll see slight variations off of what is you know announced as that high class character who's super super important, and eventually those themes end up becoming more integrated to be. Um, like more important throughout all of the characters as the series goes on too. So here's an obvious, a very obvious example that everybody knows. Everyone should know. <laughs> we got Inuyasha and Shoshomaru here. So we're gonna kind of analyze and pick their brains a bit here. Um, just from what we can tell right off the bat. <laughs> Inuyasha, well, he's wearing red. That's a really confident color. It I is think a really that's confident a confident color. guy. I'm going to pretend I don't know Inuyasha here. He looks confident. Yeah. He could be angry. He, I feel he, like he, he's, he might be angry. Yeah, power a color. Lot. Power color. Power color, sure. He doesn't look as fancy as the other guy there with the fur. No, there. yeah. yeah whoever sure. that is, I don't know. Shishomaru. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, his hand's on his sword. So, I mean, we obviously know that he's he's. Get nitty gritty with stuff, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Mm, he looks kind of basic compared to the other guy. I don't less, know. Less ornate. He looks like he can actually move. Yeah, that's, actually, that's yeah. He, he looks kind of comfy. <laughs> he, looks, he looks a lot more comfortable than the other guy. Um, but let's let's go move on to this guy over here. Now, this guy is bougie. He is. He, him, he's got him, them layers. Him beautiful is what he is. <laughs> Beautiful. He's beautiful. beautiful. He's beautiful. <laughs> he looks he looks expensive. He does look expensive. He looks expensive. He's he definitely that. wearing the furs. I don't think they live somewhere terribly cold, but not terribly hot. That's kind of hard to determine, I, I think, from that. But I would definitely say that that the fur is with given how impractically it's placed, that it's just more or less a sign of um authority yeah yeah i would say that the floof mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the armor too probably the same because armor, you know not everybody can he, probably... he looks like he has kind of a, a shell you know armor is like protective maybe it's even like in the the metaphorical sense kind of reserved kind of like mm, oh yeah I'll yeah yeah myself, that's very kind true of thing, mm -hmm. you know anything else we could see around purple there? purple yeah, yeah we got purple, purple. He's got white, so it's a pure, pure color. Maybe he has some... some Is he pure? <laughs> well, no, no. A lot of villains. A lot of villains will also wear white. Oh, yeah, you know, you're right. You're and right. it's a purity thing because they believe they in gotta the cleansing represent... of the world. The well, they have to... Um, they got to represent that standard. Yes. You know? yes. He's exactly. the purest of them all. Exactly. Got to keep it pure and clean. And fashionable. So that's kind of an example of reading between the lines, essentially, of like reading a textile. You don't normally think about that. You're just like, mm, I'm going to go and pick this off the shelf. It's the right color. But no, textiles have a little bit more in depth about them as far as like colors, weight, mm -hmm. um, texture, even. Like you could even go into Shoshomaru here and add texture where you don't even see texture because a lot of character designers. Do kind of like a basic overview of the character because they can't go into every animation style and 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 sell and like color every single detail of a texture of fabric because that would take way too long for production. So usually they kind of try and do a brief overview of it and with like a t uh, like the wave pattern here with Shishomaru here, you know, just a little glimpse into their character without. Wow. I mean, it at you. speaking a little bit, like, I think, you know, we pretended just a second ago that we did not know these characters, but, to, you know, to go back to it as people who do know about these characters, and because, you know, there are people who may not know um, a whole lot about these two in the audience, you know, Inuyasha, he is the protagonist of this series, he's super confident, he's, he can be very arrogant, he's really bold, He's really loud, and that speaks for himself in his clothing because red is a color that is oftentimes associated with us with, with anger and being really loud and bold and standing out to represent who he is within the series because you don't really see a whole lot of other characters in the series themselves wearing red, and that's what makes him, you know, Stand who out he from, is, right? With everyone. Yeah, and then, you know, we have Sashomaru here on, on the right, you know, white, like we mentioned. He he really, really values him, his self-image and whatnot. And he has to, has this idea that like, um, that he has to set that standard of, you know, what what purity is even. So, you know, white. And then obviously the first stole, he's, you know, high class armor and whatnot. Armor is not a thing that not, that everybody can, can really afford. afford. Mm -hmm. And given especially there that, you know, we perceive these textures as, Even know, during metal. like the actual feudal era too, this is a good representation of that. Like mm -hmm. you wouldn't see like the lower class having really fancy armor, metal armor mm -hmm. even, because well, metal is expensive yeah. in general. Yeah. Well, even something as simple as the fact that, like, you know, Sashomaru is wearing shoes and even oh, yeah. just not wearing yeah. shoes. <laughs> shoes. Just like little stuff. Little details. Little, little itty bitty details things. Little details will tell you about a character or even a person. This also applies to like real life, too. Right. Yeah. And I mean, um, the pants, too. Like, I mean, yeah, they're, they're both tied, but like, I think they do you. Oh, yeah. You told me the other day something. Yeah. About it. Actually, during uh, the era, a lot of samurai would tie their hakama up. So that they wouldn't get it dirty because obviously they're of a higher social status. So that kind of reflects that on what they are. They are technically what demon princes, essentially. I mean, yeah, essentially. So uh I found that 
interesting that that maybe that was probably a thought process applied to these characters to show their status to show who they are so a lot of times we often have that saying of like you know life imitates art but in this case you know our art actually kind of imitates life their life and history mm -hmm. here yeah so the thing that we have all been like waiting for the here full circle the here. full circle that we're about to get to is translating all of this into 2d and 3d so here we have shui from lamento my, my favorite guy as i call him singing so Cat we're just Mayor. gonna <laughs> we're gonna analyze him a little bit too he he doesn't look um like he stays indoor much maybe yeah i mean fujo khan says cat hobo i mean yeah, that's exactly, yeah, exactly what he looks like i mean he kind of does you know, um, I'm I'm not gonna go too much into this because I don't really want to spoil anything for anybody that may want to play this game. But looking at it, like he does, he is really perceived as a cat hobo, you know, and he's um he's presented as um a traveling poet, and that's really reads across really well given like the, the, the tatters and the clothing, obviously the the instrument, mm -hmm. yeah, and then you know a lot of the colors like we think of poetry. And, you know, as a liberal art, it's it's flashy, it's beautiful, it stands out from a lot of things, and it's fresh. It's fresh. So, yeah, his color scheme is very autumn-like, mm -hmm. it seems kind of peaceful, he seems kind of like a peaceful guy. Right, really warm colors, really um, level, like down to earth would be another way to read this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I would say so. And then let's see... So Tosi ended up making this outfit and how she wanted to translate basically the warmness of Shui, the the traveling. Yeah, I really wanted to capture it. like, you know, just him as he was, you know, as, as a traveling being. Um, obviously he is really worn and torn. You can see like all kinds of wearing and tearing on the fabric and whatnot. Yeah, so you would want to pick a fabric that is airy if it's a traveler they usually have like an airy but also kind of protective kind of textile well, yeah that's that's shown especially in the layers you know going back to the whole ideology of we wear clothes to protect ourselves from things mm -hmm. you know something as simple as layers can be in armor even without being physically like you know, plated armor or chain. Yeah, or even anything. layers like, of clothing. You're is, protecting is yourself from the weather. You're protecting yourself from bugs, if that's a thing where you are and whatnot in the forest. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. And um, so for me, um, when I did a lot of this, a lot of the orange is actually a linen, which um is an organic textile, it's something that comes from based off of a plant. Um, so I really wanted to express that down to earth. Um vibe that Shui gives off through using an organic textile, but also something because um, I live in Texas, and it's hot here all the time, um, so I wanted to wear something that was really breathable, something that wasn't going to make me, like, overheat and, like, lock in all that heat and hold it close to my body because, you know, I need to be able to, to live and breathe. That would be best, honestly. <laughs> um, and then other things, something as simple as, like, looking at the picture and seeing all the little lines on the black part of his costume there, we associate that with something like sweater material. It's like, it's a rib knit, which is a common thing that we see in, like, a lot of really casual sweaters and even just, like, t-shirts nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all have, like, perceptions of what things look like to us and how that translates into life and that's i think the really beautiful thing about cosplay is that there's so much freedom and freedom of expression that goes with all of this to where there's really no right or wrong way to like pick a correct textile or an incorrect textile you know yeah and like when you're shopping and stuff just pay attention to the fabrics you see and the shirts you see and just look at them because you you can read a lot just by looking at clothing in general yeah. too when you yeah. go let's say the scarf again scarf shopping Usually, if you're out in the elements, you're not going to buy a thin little chiffon scarf mm -hmm. to go out in the tundra or to go out in the cold in the winter time. So you you kind of wanted to emulate that with his scarf, where he well, kind of yeah, for sure, yeah, it's really flowy. He's um he's a character at, because he travels like a, you know people would assume that he's very like go with the flow, being like water and whatnot, and then he just kind of takes things like one step at a time. And so I really wanted to express a lot of that with fabrics that moved really well in the wind that are really light, but also something that, you know, gave off like a solid earthy tone and whatnot. So going back to what she said about like, you know, when you're going fabric shopping, if if you do end up doing that, 
you know, you can just walk around, like you don't even have to go into a fabric shop and just like with a preconceived idea of what you're going to use for this. Because a lot of the times that's, that's not it for me. I just go in and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go see if I can find whatever color that I want that matches this image. And then I go down to like touching everything and being like, wow, like this feels really soft. Like the person that I'm trying to cosplay, like has like a really soft spoken personality. This could really work for me. Like I really wanted to express that through the kind of thing that I'm using to make the outfit. Mm -hmm. And even with like the tears in his cloak, you wanted to pick a fabric that would tear easily. Mm -hmm. when, so you can, uh, what is the word? Weather? No. Yeah, weather. Yeah. <laughs> weather. Yeah. I mean, weather it. We talk so much about like, um, like finishing edges and whatnot. And, you know, there are some things for fabric wise that just sometimes you don't tears. have to finish those Sometimes edges. you just you want just to tear, tear them it. and leave them that tear way. Tear it, burn it. And rip yeah, it. Just, yeah, sometimes you just got to pick things like, regardless of what it's made of, you, you don't even have to be like, oh, well, he lives in the woods. So if I make his cloak out of, polyester that's not good because it's not a, a, an organic textile like no that's not what we're saying like mm -mm. you just pick whatever you want if you feel like it's going to translate really well for you with your perception of the character and what that character means to you then do it mm -hmm. just do it mm -hmm. <laughs> let it rip let it rip love that yes so here is hmm he looks like the bad guy is he the bad guy i mean i don't know i don't I mean the say black kind of he could be. He is wearing black. <laughs> he so, looks like he's he's conniving. <laughs> I mean, so uh, this is a character also from Lamento. This is Leeks. Um, I ended up actually making his outfit. And um, again, we kind of analyzing his look, kind of like what he represents. Obviously, there is some tight clothing there he looks very reserved very sh like sheltered into himself again lots of sharp shapes lots of sharp shapes very rigid like it looks that even the material looks very rigid like he has yeah, a little thing the, there well that and all of the the harsh highlights and whatnot mm -hmm. like we we preconceive that notion as like i would pre perceive it as like leather or yeah it looks something. like a leather i feel like those types of characters tend to be very black and white like this is my no way. In between. This is not this way. My way or the highway. Basically. So he looks very much like that just by looking at his clothing. Um, very edgy. A lot of black. A lot of black. A lot of black. He's a fan of black. Death, evil. Um, I don't even know what else it was so like. So here's my rendition of it. Um, obviously the photo does not have a cloak, but he has a cloak that is similar to Shuey's. Mm -hmm. Um, and also he too, without saying any spoilers, lives in the woods. So, um, I wanted to pick like materials that would reflect that kind of, despite that he's so rigid and, um, structured, I wanted at least his cloak to reflect that where he lives. So right. I picked something that was flowy kind of more natural compared to the very synthetic and leather and yeah like regardless at the end of the day of if it looks like he's wearing leather or not he's still a cat boy living in cat in, world in, in the, the woods, cat forest in the cat forest <laughs> so you know that connection to his own world even though and it just he helps visibly flesh looks him not out. a part of it it helps flesh him out even with the actual photo when you see photos of his cloak it does have like ripped edges too mm -hmm. like shoeys so it kind of helps give that organic kind of like realism to the character again translating 2d into 3d because obviously you know it's hard to capture every single texture into a 2d drawing for sure so getting kind of towards the end here huh i know has it come full circle for you guys yet <laughs> um, it's a lot of words we've said sorry <laughs> i know it's a lot of information um but how clothes speak for your character again it's just how you portray the clothing um with this one a lot of people know how from how's moving castle um when i made this i actually went and read the book itself to get further understanding on how how his personality is. I mean, if you want, you can research characters. You can research the time uh, line that they're from um, and kind of get a better understanding of their character through, you know, either 
books. Te- um, like the world, the that, world that they're imitating. And yeah, whatnot. yeah. Even if it's a made up world, again, it comes down to producers and directors take elements from this real world and apply it to the fictional world. I mean, a big example is D&D. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For D&D. Sure. When you make up your characters, you pick their clothing style. You their pick, job. I mean, you pick literally everything. Everything. It's, everything. You're, you're creating. You, I don't even want to say human being. You're creating a character from the ground up for who, whatever you want it to be. And you usually and, have something yeah. that symbolizes that character. They they have a a necklace or a jacket or something that is them. So that's what translating um, clothes into language is. Right. Yeah. And so. For me, like I just I look at this jacket and it just like it looks magical. Like people people in the chat are saying that it's it's crazy. And I mean it is, it looks magical. It looks like something that a magician would wear. Like it reads really circus-esque to me. And then like the pattern is just so busy. Like there's so much to take in that comes in from Oh, thank you. You know, like yeah, the magic see, world. So that's what I was trying to translate across without even me just say, you know, speaking for it, because I don't know who's gonna see this costume. I don't know who's gonna even Mm -hmm. see me in the costume so i wanted it to be speak for itself essentially right i wanted you to see this and be like oh that looks magical and like i said i went in depth and read the book to get a better understanding about it and i highly recommend it because it is a good book um but there were details in the book that weren't even in the movie itself that actually described the coat itself. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, I haven't. Book. I haven't read the book. So yeah. No. 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 It goes full <laughs> in detail, like how this coat looks magical. How it looks like it has a spell on it. How mm. it attracts people, which again comes into the movie. How he's so suave and fabulous. I mean, he is though. <laughs> he is. He is. So, like taking that, uh, I made my own print to put into the coat, just how like in the book said that it basically essentially there's like a curse uh, in the jacket uh, without saying any spoilers. But essentially I made a print so I can kind of relay that in the clothing itself. I made, I designed this print and if you can see closely, I'm not sure, there is a swirl that looks like a heart, which everyone knows the story of Hal as far as regarding his heart as part of the curse. Without saying too much about it if you haven't mm-hmm. seen it, but mm-hmm. a heart is a big part of the story. Heart, <laughs> curse, there's hearts, there's demons, let's just say. And so I made a pattern reflecting both of that and stuck it in the jacket itself without me actually being like, hey, this, uh, this is what this is about. So I put that ev- everywhere, basically, in that it's, jacket. It looks like it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much everywhere. And then I used a lot of, like, um, shiny, flamboyant things. I used beads. I used brocade. Um, even the lining in it, um, you can't really see in the picture. The lining, it has glitter in it. Like, it's a glitter textile. Like, this thing is very shiny, very flashy, which, again comes down to how his personality is and what he represents without telling you. He is arguably more bougie than Sashomaru. Yeah. I I don't even know if I should have even said that. (laughs) (laughs) And then here's some accessories too, because not only just clothing can speak for a character or yourself or whoever you come across, accessories too can have a profound meaning to a character as well um the example here i have is mikoto here um he's from k project Mm -hmm. it's been a while it's been a minute minute. he's from k project um without spoiling too much he he runs um he runs kind of um like a group so the premise of k project just to kind of give like a little bit of insight of like where we're going with this is that um, essentially, there's um, some groups of people who borrow um, magic from somebody who has been blessed with magic, for lack of a better term. 
than magic. Um, and so <laughs> essentially these people are like blessed with it and then they run their own groups based off of different principles and whatnot. And so um, the big, huge slogan principle for the group that Mikoto comes from is no blood, no bone, no ash. Yeah, and he's a leader of the group. So he has to have a sort of status that shows that he's of status among his peers in the group, obviously. So I wanted to really focus on the necklace that he wears and he's usually wearing this necklace a lot in the series. And so even just choosing material wise to make this necklace, again, like uh, Toasty said, his his basically anthem is- It's the, it's the anthem. <laughs> it's the anthem, no blood, no bone, no ash. So how I translated this into a physical form in the necklace is that I used blood beads for no blood. Um, and then I used buffalo bone beads for the no bone. And then the no ash is the flame pendant, pewter pendant there in the center to represent the ash that is part of the anthem. So it's essentially a physical form of their anthem that is so important to who they are as a group. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. Thanks. Um, the necklace on the other side is one actually, uh, it's a little more vague um, to it's, well, actually not. Uh, it's from Uta. I'm not sure if, if you can tell right away. Uta, um, like? From uh, Tokyo Ghoul. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought you were saying Uta as in series. I was like, no, huh? no, 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 no. Uta Nani? from Tokyo Ghoul. <laughs> okay. Um, his, his regular outfit. Uh, I wanted to make the necklace that he wears. And then again, I wanted to go in depth and personify a few of the details of who he is into the accessory itself. So even with the, the leather um, cording, I took, um, it's actually like leather, it's like a leather barbed wire cord. Hmm. It's not actually like barbed wire, obviously. Yeah, but I, I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to um, basically get how, he's very secretive, very closed off. Um, when things are like kind of closed off and secretive, you know, you usually see even like in places like you're protecting something. You're protecting something. You usually see barbed wire in places. So I thought, you know what? That's kind of an interesting element. I'm gonna tie this in. And he has a kind of a punky element. He mm -hmm. does have a punky element. Yeah. And like barbed wire, kind of rough things like that is like safety pins and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. It's very punk. If the shoe fits. Yeah, if the shoe fits. So I wanted to portray that by using the kind of barbed wire cord to make the necklace part. And then obviously he had a coin in the center. Um, and then even the little charm he had on the side, I put a little Easter egg in there um, of a clown face because- mm, Some things happen. Some things happen, there, but he's related some to- things uh, happen. To, to clown things, no spoilers here. Um, but it was a little Easter egg that I wanted to include in the, in the necklace. So it just kind of gives it a little more meaning without words yeah yeah for sure yeah just interpreting things that you see and you know that you're passionate about and finding like you know ways to you know take the things that really make up yeah you know, that and, character just and, in your own way yeah incorporating details you know that that portray that character mm -hmm. you don't have to stick to the black and white of a character design you can add your own um so with that i think we have Time for some questions? I think we do. Yeah. We have any questions? <laughs> yeah, if anybody has questions on like process or anything, or if anything was like. If you're making like, something unclear, and you're kind of stuck. Yeah, for sure. You know, we could probably suggest some things maybe to help. Where do I buy my fabrics from Darth? Well, this day and age is kind of hard to be honest because of what's going on with the <laughs> Thanks, <COVID>. corona. <laughs> so obviously we can't just waltz into a store right now. Um, I used to, I'll say in, in the BC times, the before corona before times. Before corona times. Um, I used to go to like uh, fashion districts. There's mm -hmm. some fashion districts in local cities. There's just street with like fabric stores galore. Just yeah. And it's lined just, up. They, they can be like warehouses or just like, stores like store after store after store after store of stuff and um they're not always listed what the fabrics themselves are but they do have a wider variety of things that you don't see it like your typical joannes or your typical hobby lobbies or i don't even know if hancock's is still a thing but no, if it is they're out of business 
you know, yeah. fabric stores. Yeah, either way, there's all usually in the fabric mm-hmm. districts, there's a ton of fabric. You could spend literally all day you can, just jumping store yeah. to store. We've um, done it. It's I've done it in here locally, and then I've even traveled to LA. LA has yeah. a fabulous fashion district that is just a whole mile, maybe two, mm-hmm. of just fat fa- fabric stores. It's just, forever. And you can even take to Google too if you wanted to and you just can Google, look for I mean, mom and pop you know fabric stores too because a lot of times they're not gonna have things that like cater to the masses and whatnot yeah even today's age again because we want to be safe and not go to stores a lot there's a plenty of online shops that have fabric they'll send you swatches um and you, it's just a hunt it's mm-hmm. literally a hunt to look around um and then yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's it. Like a, it. a lot of them nowadays have taken to going online, online. storefronts. Just that way you can still get like the same products without having to like physically travel anywhere or go out, and, you know, and put yourself or other people at risk. All right. Let's see. Sky Brigade says, do you have any favorite go-to fabrics? <sighs> In general, I really like using stretch satine. I think I mentioned this last a, night. It's a classic. It's, it's a really, yeah, it is a classic. If you're making jackets, if you're making vests, it's a very good, easy to use fabric, I'd say, for like beginner to intermediate sewers out there. Um, it has a nice texture. It's not matte. It has a nice subtle sheen to it. Mm -hmm. um and again it's super easy to work with it reads kind of like a suiting without it being like the same weight and like difficulty of working with a suiting if that makes any sense i really like to use it for stuff like mock-ups and like um using it to like piggyback other things um the vest that i wore yesterday was actually like a really sheer thin polyester um you know piggybacked over a stretch sateen Mm Let's see, boyfriend DLC. What is your favorite garment you've made? Oh boy. Um. Well, uh, last night I mentioned at the cosplay contest there is this, and I I really need to get pictures of this out. My favorite garment I've made is uh, Sand Play Gakpo from Vocaloid. Um. I spent a lot of time um trying to get the richness that is the song essentially into this garment um there's so much beading that i did by hand in there um textures victorian very victorian phantom of the opera like layers and layers of lace and trim and beads and just it's really decked out (laughs) but i wanted to really convey the richness that is him and the song in one so that was my favorite project that i have made i think mine was shooey <laughs> uh, like as of recently like it was like shooey that's that's one of the ones that i'm the most well that one um that that i showed in this powerpoint just because i did a lot of um like patterning on my own on that one because there's a lot of things that like there's like a like a gusseter type thing that was like there's just things that you just can't find patterns for and so i did a lot of like individual work just to kind of work that out that i was really happy with and i really just really like the way that it reads all together um but my other favorite one i would have to say that thinking about it right now is my um book of circus cl actually oh, it's really it's really shiny and well it's a circus feel again yeah it's coming just... coming th- from that unspoken word and you want to show your friend shiny. the circus? I just shinies. like the shinies. <laughs> shinies. Let's see what else is there. Um, let's see. Boyfriend asks, where did you find your Seiya suit or did I make it? That one I did alter. I was in a time crunch at the time. And so I did alter the suit. I bought a suit and I had to alter it to my size because... Which there's nothing wrong with that, by no, the way. Like, no, no, do not nothing. think that you have to make an entire suit. Oh yeah, from no, especially since you know you got like what a week to the con, and I'm working full time and don't have time to sew a full suit in 
five days. Well, that and I think honestly, like taking just like a suit that's yeah. pre-made and altering it to fit yourself. It still counts. It, it still counts. It still like, counts. It's a good way to like really get a feel for how garments are constructed because you get to deconstruct it and then look at like the seam lines and everything. And and you get a little bit of a feel of how to apply that to something like for a pre-made pattern that you can, you know, make. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can even not. like make patterns out of actual clothing. Like I could take apart this suit. My pants pattern that I use. use. My go-to pants pattern is literally from a deconstructed pair of skinny jeans from high school. Like. <laughs> it you works. Can, you can do whatever you it want. Works. You can take apart actual clothing and make a pattern for it, and it fits you just right because it's already your size. So, if you want to practice, that's a good way to practice is just altering clothing and just kind of getting a feel for like shapes and seams and just how the garment is constructed. And then eventually, you can just whip out your own patterns. Yeah. Well, that too. And you can like really get a feel for what a lot of um like big makers of clothing and whatnot use for actual garments so if you aren't really familiar with fabric which i don't blame you if you're not because it's it's a whole world and it's, it's, a whole it's I'm, i still it's learn about like fabrics every day like i i don't know everything about fabrics but you really get an idea of what's typically used for something by like looking at what the clothing you already have is and reading your labels and whatnot on your clothes so you can be like okay well you know this feels like this and gives this kind of perception so maybe i can apply it elsewhere and whatnot you learn a lot from like the things that are just around you perception's like the best learning tool that you can have mm -hmm. Let's see I think we have like one or two more we now. have time a little bit uh nagisa says what tips do you have for wig styling Ooh, take your time I have a very specific one <laughs> oh, that she... everybody always judges me really, we, really. We hard have chaotic for. good here. I have chaotic. I yes, it's so chaotic. I style my wigs while I'm wearing them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> everybody I know puts them on wig heads, but I always do it while I'm wearing them. I have a really, really small face. And so um what I'll do is is I'll put on like the unstyled wig, I'll get all of my tools together. Anything that I could possibly need in the moment, like scissors, like a hair razor, a comb, Mess a brush. Um, I like to use the got to be hairspray and the got to be hair gel is really good. And um, I'll just have a reference picture up or, or a few of them on my phone and just swipe through while I'm doing stuff. Start off with one side of the wig, pin the rest of it out of the way and just kind of you know, start, at start cutting at it. And then matching the way that the, the hair fibers sit on my face in correlation to what it is on the references face. So for example, like, you know, if the the middle bangs come down to like their mid middle of their nose bridge, like that would be different for me as it would be for her. So I want it to to look, you know, like it's believable on my face and that it was meant to be worn by me instead of just, you know, mass for like whatever. So I just do it on my face, honestly. Um, <laughs> I'm a mess. I, I know. I do the traditional put it on a wig head um and take my time cutting it there is actually a lot of good just even like hair and wig tutorial cutting videos on youtube mm -hmm. and i mean a lot of the it's similar to actually cutting hair hair it like is. Oh, there's a lot of point clipping and stuff like that um you can learn a lot from just seeing videos on trimming just a basic how do i trim my hair tutorial on youtube you can find it and apply it oh, to yeah. a wig right away but final touches i usually do like when i'm actually wearing the wig just so again like she said it kind of matches my face because mm -hmm. i might clip it and it won't match my face in compared to the mannequin head because my head is a different shape from the mannequin head i do all of the back of the wig and like a bunch of like a whole gaze and whatnot like while it's on an actual mannequin head because once i have the front of it done and like fit to my face i can like put it on a mannequin head and then like even it out as I need to in the back from the front. So I do a little bit of both, but like 98% of the time it's on my head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so not a moon child says, do you have suggestions on how to start learning advanced techniques? Um, we're interested in learning beading, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they, apparently they like to watch tutorials. Um, there is Pinterest. Well, there's Pinterest and then there's a lot of, um, there are tutorials on YouTube, but I'm a bookie. Um, mm -hmm. I actually learned my beading and stuff from actual books. 
Um, you could even go to, to be honest, half price books. I kid you not. You could go into. Oh yeah. Old textbooks. You old can find textbooks. like a million It's still there. relevant today. Sewing a button is the same as probably 20, 50 years ago. Probably. So <laughs> I'm the complete opposite though. I do not learn really well from like reading material. I learn really well from like seeing it happen in front of me and then like me mirroring what's happening in front of me. So for me, um, like whenever I'm just like surfing on like Pinterest or whatever for uh, Lord knows what every now and again the algorithm will be a, like give me a video of somebody doing some sort of embroidery or beading or something and I just kind of like pay attention to how exactly like they're positioning the beads what kind of thread they might be using and then just kind of yeah play so with it from there I, yeah you can there's lots of media I mean it's the age of internet so you can look online there's videos but I traditionally like going into books because you get sometimes even the more vintage style of beading and embroidery that isn't very common out in like newer sources mm -hmm. right now because yeah. it's, it's more of an aged like technique and it's not really used that much right now like in Victorian ages embroidery and beading was the thing but here today I mean there's no embroidery in my suit or anything so it's not really something that's valid these days as far as like it is if you want it to be it, it is it is but if you want it to be say that um let's see here I think we have one maybe one more okay fluffball ren says how would a shorter cosplayer give a taller feel with cosplays with tall characters trench coats and cloaks yes i am a tiny person i'm here to help you <laughs> um choose so um first of all princess seams are your best friend um princess seams are going to be things um so this is a dart it's not exactly princess seam but a princess seam is something that's um a vertical um dart basically that is in the middle of the garment and what those kinds of seams do vertical they make you look like you're taller mm -hmm. they, they don't squish you down like like horizontal, horizontal stuff thing. does the vertical stuff will make you look taller um i can't really say like make to be taller out of anything besides wearing platform shoes every single shoe that i own for cosplay is platform of some degree um you can also get inserts i think for your shoes she yeah, uses them pretty i sometimes often. use them for the really tall characters they're just like little heel inserts you stick in your shoe um they're comfortable for the most part it depends on the shoe you got to try them out mm -hmm. but um you can wear them usually without any problems and you're at least a little like maybe an inch taller or half an inch taller um there's also like uh you know photo techniques that can make yeah. you look taller um, posing techniques that can make you look taller. Posture is a really, Posture, really big thing. Um, um, one thing that I, I can say for sure that does help read really well in, in pictures is whenever you're taking pictures, just make sure your shoulders are back. And then um, just sit in front of a mirror and play around with the shoulders back. Make sure your, your back is straight. And then practice like pushing your chin out, but not necessarily up. Like you want to like be like back and like push it out. It helps elongate your neck and give you a better of a jawline, so that way it can kind of add to that illusion of you looking taller without necessarily being 5'9". I'm 5'3", so, like, I understand I'm short. And like she said, like, um, even in textiles, there are certain things that will make you look shorter and things that will make you look wider. And stripes, horizontal stripes, will make you look wider. So if you're trying to avoid looking wide, you want to avoid any line that is horizontal is even like dresses what is the dresses the bust dresses mm. that are horizontal if you have big shoulders if you don't I want if you're you're kind of not feeling so good about your shoulders and you don't want your shoulders to look bigger you want to avoid seams the diagonal like that are horizontal seams are really good for that too actually mm -hmm. kind of like the, things things that do like this that's, yeah that's good yeah, for that the too. diagonals are good for broad shoulders um vertical again is for if you want to look taller thinner um vertical lines are the way to go for that stripes stripe supply um i can't think of anything else think that, anything that's else. all of my my hacks that i've discovered throughout the <laughs> years that i have for you on that one nice. <laughs> <laughs> i hope it helped i hope it helped yeah um i, I, I don't think i, I think, think that's, that's it. it i think we've covered for sure well, much. thank y'all so much. Really appreciate y'all yeah, coming thank in here to support you. us. Yeah, for for coming and learning about 
the language of textiles. If you have any questions about anything, feel free to poke um, yeah, either you can of us. Message us. Um, her social media is right there on, on the, the screen. I think it's on the screen. Uh, um, if not, it's um, it, I believe it was posted in the chat by one of the mods. Um, you can poke either of us on Yeah, Instagram and if you have whatever. any other questions on like what you want to use, you could just drop us a line and let us know, you know, hey, I'm having trouble finding a fabric for this costume. What do you suggest? I'll give it to you. Even if you message me and go toasty, I don't know which color I like better. Which one do you like? I'll be that friend for you. you can yeah. Do it. Yeah, I'll be there for you. Totally. <laughs> we'll help you. We love sure. it. All righty. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for Have coming. Have a good rest the of the con. Enjoy the con. Thank you.